and welcome to Just The Job, the show that gives you a behind the scenes insight into a huge range of exciting career opportunities. Now this week, we've got a diverse lineup of great career possibilities and you never know one of them could be just the job for you. In today's show, we head to Hawke's Bay and meet up with Francesca Mooney, who is checking out careers in fruit production. Then we're in Auckland with Chase Madsen as he discovers the graduate career opportunities with Coca-Cola Amatil. And finally, we're in the red zone in Christchurch as Kyle Tikawa checks out concrete construction. So let's get the show underway and head to the sunny orchards of Hawke's Bay. Hi, I'm Francesca. I'm 16 years old. I go to Teradale High School and I'm interested in learning about fruit production. Francesca has headed to Hastings to take a look at the Crassborn Fruit Operation. The company run a large export pack house and they either own or lease some 30 orchards in the area. It's harvest time and orchard manager Shane Flynn is going to show Francesca what his job is all about. Hiya Francesca. Hi Shane. Got plenty to show you right in the middle of harvest. Okay. Follow me. Cool. At this time of the year many seasonal workers head here. At Tamata, the orchard Shane manages, there might be up to 80 workers. So to get an idea of the scale of this operation, Francesca heads to a great vantage point. So is all of this here your responsibility? Like... Yeah, so we run from the top there all the way down until the big sheds at the back. Um, it's about 50 odd hectares of just um, apple and pears, just pip fruit. So it's into the orchard where Francesca gets to learn all about apples. Shane grows several varieties and Francesca's going to get a taste of some. And here we've got Red Delicious, Granny Smith, Royal Gala, Lady in Red, Fuji Supreme and Fuji Candy. Why the newer varieties? Like what's wrong with these ones? Um, it's pretty much market driven so the markets are after high colour fruit that'll catch the eye. At the start of a picking shift, Shane conducts what's known as a fruit lineup where the team learns what standard is required. Using fingers as a measure, he shows Francesca what size yeah, they need to be. Okay, Time to put her new up. knowledge yep. to the test. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Good fit. Four yep. fingers. Awesome. Perfect size. There's a right and a wrong way to pick. Yeah. Cadet Harry Fraser shows her how. Palm on the bottom, slowly sliding up. Yeah, and just remember that technique to slowly slide up. Okay. So they must be gently handled all the time and then very gently lowered into the bin. During harvest, um, up at times at the peak of the season, I can have 70 to 80 people on this orchard picking, um, tractor driving, forklift driving, truck drivers, um, and everything. So it's what a um, busy time. Shane's been keen to embrace learning new techniques, and his many awards show just that. The pip fruit industry is changing, and one of the biggest changes is with the size of the trees. As you can see, Francesca, these are big old Granny Smith trees that have a lot of work involved in picking, seeing they're so large. Whereas in here, we're in a dwarfing variety with dwarfing rootstocks. Um, the trees are a lot more accessible, but they're a lot more flimsy, so that's why we need the support structure here with the five wires holding up the tree to carry the crop. Today, Cadet Harry Fraser is meeting primary ITO training advisor Norm Miller for an assessment. Norm is a dedicated promoter of the Hawke's Bay fruit industry. Well, the industry really needs people like Harry, and, and there's just about an insatiable appetite for that. Um, but all the cadets that we put through the program are easily employed at the end, and often are um, uh, leading hands, managers even. And some of them go into other um, jobs around the industry, such as uh, agrochemical reps or tractor salesmen and all sorts of things. One of, one of the perceptions that, that's out there is that this is about climbing ladders and picking fruit. It's much more than that. It's actually science and action. There's a tremendous amount of planning of, of, of um, you know, important decisions to be made. It's not just picking apples. When the fruit starts to ripen, apples are randomly selected for testing. This is to be done to test the fruit for pressures, um, sugar levels, to see if they're ready and to make a go date when we start to pick them. And we've got to not just do one tree, we've got to do 10, 15 trees spread out through the block. Francesca heads to the Crassborn lab in Hastings. Here James Jones shows her how the tests are done. The percentage of colour or blush is recorded 
Then using a colour scale, the shade of the greenest part is recorded too. Next, a pressure test, which records the firmness of the apple. So we, it goes in as far as the notch and then you release it. And a recording is electronically transferred to the wow. computer. <laughs> so Francesca has a go. The machine she's using is called a penetrometer. Finally, sugar levels or bricks are measured using a refractometer and a few drops of juice are dropped on a pane. The combined results will indicate when the apples should be picked. Here at the Craspawn Packhouse, many tons of apples are processed for export every day. They come through the grade tables. This is one of many, as you can see. The ladies here are, are sorting. They're looking for defects. So any, anything that is, is no good for export market is, is removed. Uh, moving on down through the sizer, we take a photo, looking for the colour, looking for the colour of the apple, are they nice and red, and, and the machine sorts them by colour break. So nicer colour will go to one market, uh, a lower colour will go to a different market. So it can tell the colour? It can tell the colour, absolutely. Back in the orchard, there'll be many weeks before the harvest is finally over. And with 70 or more seasonal staff on board, it's set to be busy for a while. I believe, to be honest, the right people are the people that turn up to work with a smile on their face um, and the right attitude and the rest can just come naturally as we train them. So, has Francesca been a good apple here? Francesca's done really well. She was very keen, asking very intelligent questions and um, she turned up with a smile on her face, so we're halfway there already. I really enjoyed my time here, especially learning about the different kinds of fruit and seeing what happens to them when they leave here. I think it's a really interesting industry. The Cadetship Program is a partnership between the Local Growers Association, Primary ITO and Local Polytechs and private training establishments. There are no specific entry requirements. You earn while you learn. There is a shortage of people working in the industry, so career prospects are excellent. Well done, Francesca. Looks like you enjoyed that apple. After the break, we check out graduate opportunities with Coca-Cola. Don't go away. Welcome back to Just The Job. Time now to check out a career that could be the real thing for you. Hi, I'm Chase Madsen, and I want to check out what opportunities Coca-Cola Amatil have for graduates. Chase is at Coca-Cola Amatil in Auckland, where he'll get special insight into the company behind many of New Zealand's famous beverage brands. Coca-Cola Amatil employ 25,000 people across Australasia, with 1,100 of those people in New Zealand. And they are searching for university graduates for a number of roles. Hey Chase, Martin King. I'm the General Manager of HR here at Coca-Cola, and we're going to go and explore graduate opportunities, so let's go. So why do you want to attract graduates to work at Coke? We're, we're a big business and we are constantly looking for great talent. And what we recognise is we're better off bringing talent in, good, bright young graduates, good degrees, and then investing in them and growing talent to become our future leaders. Cool, and what kind of jobs can you go into at Coke? We're a big business, so we've got anything you can possibly think of from a career, um, from merchandising, marketing, distribution, manufacturing, human resources. Um, so as a graduate, honestly, take your pick, and we probably can create a career that's fantastic for you. These five graduates have worked at Coke for 18 months and came with a range of degrees, like Stefan Kovic, who did a Bachelor of Commerce majoring in Economics. Is what you're doing now related to what you studied at university? My degree doesn't specifically relate to the jobs I'm doing. It, I guess it helped build my skills in you know, management and dealing with workloads and all that, so it's, it's not, yeah, not really anything to do with what I'm doing, but... <laughs> <laughs> really interesting feedback from Stefan because certainly what we're looking at as a business is, is not that you have a specific degree and you work in a specific area and it's locked down. We're looking for people who've got good degrees, who want to come into a business and really gain breadth. Um, and in our business, because we're so big and complex, um, the, the more breadth you get in our business, the more likelihood you've got an opportunity to move into senior roles. Stefan's experience is a classic case of the kind of graduates that we're looking for. And one of the places where graduates can kick off their career is on the manufacturing floor, where products are made and bottled. OK, Chase, this is our blow-fill machine. This is where we produce bottles that they start off as a little pre-film like this, and they blow into a full-finished bottle. So what's it like working in here? Oh, it's pretty interesting. As you can see, there's um, lots of brand-new machinery and 
high tech, it runs pretty quickly, so when it's going full speed, it's 27,000 bottles an hour. You learn a lot and you get to see, you know, right from the ground level where, you know, our product comes from. To make 27,000 bottles an hour requires a constant supply of raw materials like plastic bottles, caps, sugar and fruit juices. And making sure that supply doesn't suddenly run out is part of graduate Carlton Wong's job in the distribution and supply department. Hi Chase, how's it going? Good. So what's your job here at Coke? I was hired as a supply network coordinator last year and uh, basically what the job entails is a lot of uh, raw materials forecasting and sourcing of them. As, a... as part of his career development, Carlton was given a rerouting project, an important distribution project that he used as a chance to make his mark at Coke and advance his career. So what's the overall aim for rerouting? I guess the ultimate aim is making sure our delivery side is as efficient and optimised as possible. So even a small change every day when you multiply it over a year is going to make a big difference? Oh yeah, absolutely. Supply and distribution houses other graduates like Lucy Marsh. What do you actually do at Coke? At the moment I'm working on a little pet project in the health and safety team. So I've been working on making the car park a safer place. What we did is we put in the speed signs, put in some judder bars, also put in a courier park so the couriers knew exactly where they needed to park. So this project is an opportunity for Lucy to develop her career and Coke offers several other yes, ways Sam. to progress Hello. like mentoring programs. Right. Good, good. Nice to see you. Sales graduate Sam Hartstone is paired up with experienced mentor Parrish Samuel who offers help navigating this fast-paced environment where you are judged on your performance. One of your challenges the last time was um, you know, their strong personalities tend to, to overwhelm you. Bringing grads into our business brings a whole new uh, thinking. Uh, they're open-minded people, they've learned the latest theories. So if you take that with our experience from you know, the, the rest of the business, it brings a nice blend and they're young, enthusiastic, makes older fellas like myself feel a bit young. Chris Litchfield, the General Manager of Sales for New Zealand, started as a graduate in 1992. So Chase is keen to know what his secret was getting to the top. How did you get from graduate entrance to General Manager of Sales? A lot of hard work. Uh, to be honest, the places like Coke, uh, there is just so much going on and there's so much to learn. So I've always had a really strong focus on you know, learn what you can, be good at what you're doing, um, prove that you can always do the next job. And from there I've literally springboarded from one role to the next, collected a lot of experience working in a lot of different areas into the general management role. So um, all that experience really does come good in the long run. There's really unlimited opportunities to move up the ladder, to move sideways, uh, to move across different business units, really based on you as an individual. So if you come in, prove yourself, um, get known, um, then your performance will speak for itself. We're a very performance driven business. And a key performance indicator is being able to fill customer orders quickly. Sure thing. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Chase. I'm Sam. I'm a uh, sales graduate here at Coca-Cola. I just need your help with entering an order. So what's it like being a graduate at Coke? Uh, it's awesome. I mean, every day is different and the people are awesome, which I think is a really crucial part of um, working for a big company. We recognise that the best way to have high performing talented people is to invest in them ourselves and actually kind of train them the way that we want them to work. Um, so get them young, get them um, with good degrees, bring them into our business and we'll teach you the ropes. Um, so in that way we also think that people will stay and they'll commit to us because of the investment that we've made in them. So Chase picks up the product from the warehouse to get the urgent order out fast. Are you out on the road a lot? Yeah, 90% of the time I'm on the road building relationships with customers and really managing that rapport that we have with them. Um, it's a key part of my job. So, yeah. Thanks, mate, and good luck for the future, and I hope that I'll see you around soon. Thanks. Cheers. I've found out that there are a lot of career opportunities for graduates here at Coke, and not only that, but they also put a lot of time and energy into mentoring you and developing your career. To be a graduate entrant at Coke, you will need to have a university degree, but the degree you have does not necessarily need to match up with the career you are applying for. You can find out more at cokecareers.co.nz. Well, Chase, that could be just the job for you. In a few minutes, we head to Christchurch, but first, here's Sarah from Careers New Zealand. Thanks, Clinton. 
Well, the career opportunities at Coca-Cola seem to have captured Chase's imagination. But if you haven't seen a career that captures your imagination yet from the ones we've seen so far, don't worry. Head to the Careers New Zealand website and try out our interactive tools at www.careers.govt.nz. You'll find heaps of information that will help get your career planning off to a great start. Thank you, Sarah. After the break, we head to the Red Zone in Christchurch as Kyle checks out some concrete construction techniques. Welcome back to Just The Job. We're off to Christchurch now with Kyle. Hey, I'm Kyle. I'm from Kashmir High School and I'm interested in a career in concrete construction. Kyle is going to spend a couple of days looking at the work of a concrete construction specialist in Christchurch. With the city centre rebuild finally kicking in, the industry is entering a huge boom period, so it's a time of immense opportunity. Oh, at the Lee's yeah, construction, construction office site, he's meeting the director of new business, yeah. Mike Knowles. Inside the Christchurch Red Zone, Lee's are building a big new retail and office block. There's an all-important safety induction, and then Mike and Kyle head off to the Red Zone to see the new building site. Lee's is a local company, and yeah, we're very keen and passionate about the, the rebuild, and we've been very actively involved to date. Concrete is quite important with the rebuild. Like, oh, it's huge. We're seeing um, more and more concrete in the jobs than ever before, um, largely due to the um, unstable ground, ground conditions in the inner city here. They're requiring um, a lot more concrete foundations. The, the job actually we're going to go see today is um, it's got a thousand, nearly a thousand cubic metres of concrete in the, um, in the foundations, which is phenomenal for a building of its size. Um, that, that pour was, uh, we did 650, nearly 700 cubes, I think, in one day, um, which is the largest pour in, in the, um, the rebuild to date, actually, so um, something we're quite proud of. It's a short drive through the red zone to the construction site where site manager Neil Rippey takes charge. Neil has very successfully worked his way up in the industry and early in his career won an Apprentice of the Year award. A lot of firsts for the building. The entire facade across the front will all be glass. It's quite, a, quite an advanced building and it's going to be um, a, a bit of an icon on this corner surrounded by some of the old builds with a new sort of modern uh, facade. The main floors will hang from a huge central core. At one end, two concrete sheer walls will enclose stairs and other facilities. So time to learn some basics about building with concrete. Carl's going to help build a concrete block. Um, the construction is the same as what we do with a sheer wall. You're going to um, box up uh, our form. We're going to run some divvy-dag rods through the middle um, to support the form. Kyle's got to build a strong box to contain the concrete. First job, coat the box walls with an oil so the concrete doesn't stick. Squeeze that in, mate. Oh, the challenges are day to day. Um, even just um, dealing with staff, getting them to, to do the job that you want in the timelines that it's required, making sure that you've got the planning uh, and robust program there that the contractors are, are going to achieve the targets. The wire cage is reinforcement which will bind the concrete together. You're dealing with conflict, contractors, um, also architects, engineers, local city council. It's, um, you're sort of like a little bit of a hub and you're drawing everyone in to, to complete the project um, on time and on budget. With the box finished, the concrete truck arrives. Apprentice Jack Burmeister has been given Kyle a hand. All right, Kyle, all we're doing here is liquefying the concrete, trying to get all the air bubbles out of it. Once the concrete's been poured in and the air bubbles removed, the block needs to be smoothed and finished. All right, Kyle, what we're doing now is we're trying to screed out the concrete. You want to get it flush with this yellow line right here. So just smooth moments. Jack's recently been taken on by Lees and really loves the job. So uh, what got you into the building industry? Um, two years ago after the Christchurch earthquake, I decided that construction would be a good, good path to go down with all the work that's going to be coming up for years and years. Jack did a quantity surveying course at Christchurch Polytech and now is doing an apprenticeship with BC ITO. So uh, what do you like about being an apprentice? Firstly, I like working outside. I can never see myself in a desk job. Secondly, you've sort of got about 400 teachers. Everyone that comes on site seems to be, all the older fellas seem to be a lot more knowledgeable than myself. So can you tell me what the minimum height for, um, for tow, board, uh, tow boards is? Uh, it's 225 millimetres. Excellent, excellent. Um, you come in at uh, apprenticeship level, you could start off doing framing. Um, I've definitely done my fair share of framing. Um, digging holes, um, posts, simple decks, things like that. Um, concrete construction, your basic formwork, um, working in with a crew, they usually butter you up. The principle of building a concrete wall is much the same as Kyle's block. 
Concrete is poured into a reinforced chamber formed by wooden walls known as shutters. You've got your reinforcing in the middle. Um, again, we line up our divvy dags through, through the steel the um, as we pull the shutters together. So again, we've got these big props. They're connected to our platform. Basically, these will wind in. And that will push that entire shutter into the reinforcing face. It takes at least 24 hours for concrete to set. So next day before Kyle gets to examine his concrete block efforts, Mike Knowles takes him on a red zone tour. The scale of a rebuild really is immense, isn't it? Oh, it's huge, you know. I've heard lots of people talked about it as being um, possibly the biggest sand pit in the world at the moment if you're into construction, which means, you, you know, if you've got an interest in building, it's all happening here. Um, you know, certainly in New Zealand anyway, uh, the, Going forward, Christchurch is going to be the, the place to be for construction. There's just so many damaged or destroyed buildings that we've got to replace and fix, so yeah. So time for Kyle to take off the shutters and reveal the concrete block. Nice. Oh, I love my job. I I get up in the morning, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to work, <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and again, I get, I'm quite passionate about interiors as well. Good design, good um, sort of robust planning and... and, and um, having those opportunities to work on. So what do you reckon your concrete block? Oh, it's pretty neat. So, all good. Has Carl got the right build for the job? Hey, Carl's done a fantastic job today. Um, real keen and enthusiastic, which we like to see in the trade. I found the building site really interesting and how it all works around and runs. I didn't even knew how to build a concrete block before. and It's interesting the way it works and how it all turns out. There are a number of national certificates available from entry level up. There are no entry requirements, but it helps to have NCA Level 2, Maths and English. You earn while you learn. There's a new government subsidy available to enrolling apprentices in priority construction trades. Thanks, Kyle, and also thank you to Chase and Francesca for being a part of this week's program. Now, to find out more about the training opportunities and careers featured throughout all of our Just The Job stories, check out our program website, tvnz.co.nz slash justthejob, or simply Google Just The Job. So best of luck, and I'll see you again next week. see more of New Zealand on air.